Welcome to the D.A.R.E. podcast, where it is all about helping people overcome anxiety and panic attacks. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is free to download at dareresponse.com. Now, without further ado, here is the D.A.R.E. podcast. Hello, everyone. Sorry, guys, you're stuck with me. Um, I need us away on holiday uh, for this webinar, so I will be... um, answering all of these submitted questions. I don't think we're going to get through all of them, but I will do my best to try and get through as many as possible. Anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Michelle Cavanaugh. Um, I am one of the coaches here at DARE. And um, you might have seen me on, I don't know, some of these videos and some of the old recordings of these webinars. All right, guys, let's get going. Okay. <clears throat> Question number one, what is the best way to combat Feelings of anxiety that just last 24-7 and a state of constant feeling of impending doom and like something is wrong with my head. So kind of starting off with the the basis of dare, which is, did you guys hear the word? Who picked up on the word? Who are some of my oldies who have been around for a while? Combat. Yep. Thanks, Rose. That's the word. What is the best way to combat feelings of anxiety? And then Yep. Okay. Everybody else is posting combat too. Exactly. Dare is a little bit different than maybe what you might be used to. Somebody just posted, we love a good fight. We sure do because we're good at it. We're good at fighting. We're good at figuring out. We're good at solving problems. Um, So you're not combating feelings. You're not combating the feeling of impending doom. Your body keeps you in a heightened state because you're in combat mode. Okay. Impending doom, this heightened state, um, feel it's the state that your body sends you in when it senses you need to fight. So when it, it gets the message to kind of come back down to rest and digest mode, when it, you have to stop the fighting first, it follows your behavior. So you don't need to fight just because you feel uncomfortable. You feel uncomfortable because you are fighting. And so this is why, like, we kind of teach it backwards here. You surrender the fight of, and it's not to check to see if it worked, if it got rid of the feeling of. Anxiety has become the identified threat. The feeling of anxiety, the state of fight or flight mode has now become the identified threat. And if as long as you keep fighting that feeling, you will remain in that state. So you don't fight, you don't combat. You. This is where you use dare. You you acknowledge the state that you're in. Oh, I feel a feeling of impending doom. And you feel the feeling of impending doom. You don't try not to feel it. You don't use techniques to get through it. You don't get stuck in reassurance that it will be gone. That's more of the disordered behavior than the present feeling. Does this make sense, everybody? Especially for the new people. Again, and it feels like something is wrong with my head. This is generally all roads kind of point back inside to us. And anything that pops up that doesn't feel good for us, it's a sign of what's wrong with me. Oh my God, what's wrong with me? That's weird. What's wrong with me? And I can't get rid of it. There must really be something wrong with me if I can't get rid of it. And so it's it's this constant story of everything that pops up that I find unpleasant is some sign of there's something wrong with me, or I'm a bad person, or something's going to be wrong. Notice that vocabulary. Anybody in this chat speak like that. It's always a sign of I can't get I, I can't this feeling means something's wrong with me. And because I can't get rid of the feeling also means something's wrong with me. All right. Okay, great. Yes, 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 yes. Good. So we're all on the right call. <laughs> okay. Trucking along. Question number two. I think I might have a bit of mental health anxiety. I'm so terrified of mental illnesses slash disorders, such as schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, split personality. We don't really use that term anymore. How do I overcome this? And so I actually posted about this on my Instagram page yesterday about health anxiety because the day before I posted about health anxiety, um, about health, like um, heart palpitations and diseases that I can have based on physical discomfort. And then somebody commented, um, what about uh, mental health? My answer was mental health is health. So it's the same thing. It follows the same template. If you guys, did anybody um, see that post 
Um, it's, it's somebody just, uh, the post is somebody going like this, pushing against this big bubble. And it had all these little bubbles in it. And it's basically, it follows the same form, whether it's cardiac health or GI health or mental health. We're all tr fighting something to make sure the big bad thing doesn't happen. Whatever the big bad thing is for you. The fight is not preventing the big bad thing. You spending your day trying to not have cancer does not prevent cancer or heart attack or schizophrenia. So it doesn't matter if it's body health or mental health. It follows the same pattern. And usually when we're looking to see, do I have the problem? Like where, what's the sign that I'm actually developing the problem? We're looking for all different versions of present discomfort. And so we take, sorry, I don't know if you can see the person behind me. I don't know. I'm not in my official new office yet. Guys, I moved. Oh, he's still there. Um, I moved two weeks ago. And so I'm I'm in a little bit of office purgatory until I get into my office office, um, hopefully by the next webinar. Um, so where are we? Mental health anxiety means I am trying not to go crazy. I don't like the term, but that's the term we're just going to use. Um, I don't want to develop these disorders. These ones, these are okay. Not these. And so you're probably spending your day looking for whatever reminds you of bipolar disorder. Okay. Whatever your bias view of bipolar disorder is, we all have these biases of how we think it's going to feel like. And so that person is going to notice their fluctuating mood probably. Oh, wow, I was so in such a bad mood now. And now I was like so happy for 10 minutes. Oh my gosh, is that bipolar disorder? <gasps> oh no. And so in order to make sure I don't have bipolar disorder, I must always make sure I maintain a stable mood that doesn't fluctuate much at all. And now here's more anxiety because this guy is cranking out energy because you are spending a lot of time involved here, right? But you're fighting something that's not happening. If you don't have, if you're not having a heart attack, you fighting your imagination of a heart attack doesn't pre-fight a heart attack. It just gives you anxiety, right? Now your body's cranking out fight energy because you're fighting or trying to prevent. So dare is to drop the fight of, the resistance of, because you're fighting non-fightable things. What if I get schizophrenia is not the same thing as schizophrenia. And even if you are diagnosed with the diagnosis of schizophrenia, your present fight of what you have doesn't fight away what you have either, right? So it, the fight cranks out the feeling. Okay. As long as I keep fighting, my body will keep me in a heightened state mode. So the answer to what if I develop a mental illness is, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, maybe it could, which was my post today. Who saw my post today on, the, on my Instagram page? The coulds. Okay. Here are the world of the coulds. I went through these questions briefly. I scanned through a lot of them and a lot of them Follow that same template. Here's something that's happening here that reminds me of something that could there. <gasps> I don't want that could to happen. Better make sure it doesn't. And we stay over involved in the present discomfort because we're hooking it to a worst case scenario. And so it's learning how to accept the coulds. This guy is sending you energy to fight a could. And the way you treat coulds, this is how you respond to coulds. Yeah, could. Not reassure, not constant chronic reassurance of, no, it's not going to. No, it'll probably be fine. No, it'll all work out. It hasn't happened before. Yes, use that logic for like the first second, the first five seconds to have a rational, grounded response. And then after that, it's the coulds get treated with a nod. I could get up from this chair and break my leg. <gasps> I don't like the idea of breaking my leg. This is the, the jolt, the response to that thought of something that could that I find unpleasant. Okay. And the next part is where we get into disordered area of now me trying to not break my leg. Does this make sense? Does this hit home for anybody? Now I'm only trying to not break my leg because I'm imagining what it would be like to break my leg. And that would be the 
worst thing because let me tell you how terrible it would be because I could break my leg and then what if it doesn't heal and then I can't bring my kids to school and then uh, I can't go to work ah, la, 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 la. better make sure it doesn't happen and so now I'm getting up from my chair carefully don't break your leg and walking around carefully because I might break my leg and if you're spending your day trying to not break your leg you still could break your leg but now you're spending your day surviving instead of living Okay, so it's really surrendering to the coulds. You fighting here about the coulds of there keeps you in this out of sync state where the world is basically safe right here, but you are in non-safe mode. Okay, your imagination of how things could become unsafe. Yeah, that's right, it could. And should there become here, I will definitely fight here. That makes sense. Anything about a what if is your embattlement with your own imagination. That's what it is. And you can imagine anything you want. Imagination is safe because it's a thought and thoughts are safe. You are in no more or less danger if you imagine something wonderful that could or if you imagine something terrible that could. Okay, you might be in a higher level of distress, you might be experiencing more anxiety or more bothered or more disgust, or whatever the feeling that I find unpleasant. And then we usually attend to those thoughts to try and alleviate those feelings. But again, feelings are in danger either. But if you start to treat things as danger, your alarm will clearly keep showing you the thing you're fighting and send you energy to keep fighting. Sorry, that was a little bit of a long-winded response, but I try to also make that general so it can kind of apply to many, many other questions that I'm not going to get to. But just to ask in the chat, who on this chat gets stuck fighting here, trying to prevent there? Yeah, okay, here come all the me's. And so, yeah. And so that's why like all these questions might take, um, they might look different on the surface, but I want you to be able to start picking up on the same common threads where it's the, if you're here fight the way this guy works well, it's the here fight needs to be paired with here danger. So somebody posted this before and then somebody else just posted it, but it's fighting the anxiety feeling exactly. Anxiety is not danger either. Fear is not danger. Your body sends you fear so you can use fear to stay alive in danger, right? You use fear for danger. Fear itself is not danger. And here comes our F word. But if you, some Robert, you beat me to it. My physical sensations always feel like danger. I don't want to feel it 24 seven. That's the, that's the stuck part. Me trying not to feel. It's embattlement with feel. I know this sounds opposite maybe of things that you guys have done before. Um, trying to feel better, which is not problematic. I don't know. I know if you're listening to this on a podcast, you're not going to be able to see this picture. But if you go over to the YouTube channel, this should be up there. It's at some point you can see it there. Actually, I should ask, can you guys see the words written the right direction? Okay, good. Thank you. There are, we experience fluctuating levels of discomfort. Okay. And this is your relationship with fluctuating levels of discomfort. Of course, we all want this down here. Of course we do. And there's nothing wrong with feeling comfort. But when we start labeling comfort as safe, I'm safe when I feel comfortable when I feel these things that I like and when I don't feel these things because I don't like these things because I don't want to feel these things and if you're are constantly involved and battling and pushing and struggling and fighting this is the disorder not this this part here me constantly battling a fluctuating feeling on these calls most the majority of our calls are about anxiety but a lot of these questions came in also talk about fluctuating mood or fluctuating energy levels, fatigue, 
pain, other physical sensations, sad, anger, memories, right? Fluctuating levels of things that I find bothersome, sleep, and how I treat fluctuating levels of things that are bothersome. So you can attend to this, but this is usually, most people only show you this how to calm down, how to self-regulate, how to feel better. And then that's fine. But then your body only gets the message that I'm safe when I feel better. And in comes us where it's, it's also safe to feel bad. Again, bad's not feeling, but just using the word there, a little judgy, but it's safe to feel uncomfortable. And so that's the message we try and send here, Adair. And this is what we're trying to teach, how to grow your capacity to feel anxiety, to feel disconnected, to feel dizzy. Okay. So this is not, we're not doing this to check to see if this went down either. Okay. I try so hard to accept and allow. Why is this feeling still here? Then you're using this as a weapon to get rid of. Surrender, let go, allow, give permission for. It's to kind of teach you how to become uninvolved in the thing that's here while your body is still allowed to continue fluctuation, while your mood is allowed to continue to fluctuate, while your thoughts kind of come and go. You sit and you become an observer. You become curious, Claire Weeks, right? You be, you're interested. Any of those books out there that sound similar to this, we're all kind of trying to say the same thing. We may be saying it in different ways. It's like just being an observer of the automatic things your bodies do rather than trying to get involved and micromanage them just because we find things we find unpleasant. All right. Let's keep going. I would, here's a pretty good question. I would like to know if there is a thing as too much exposure where I'm kept too much on high alert for too long, like working in a place that stresses me out too much, partly due to anxiety combined with a somewhat challenging, stressful family life. Thank you. So who, who deals, who, who has a similar question? Who does a lot of exposure therapy? Who has done exposure therapy before? Glad this was asked me. Okay. So same thing, we, we tend to turn everything into like a technique or a challenge or something to see if it works, or I spend a lot of money for my therapist to come and we're going to walk 20 feet from my house today. And yesterday I walked 10 feet. Exposure therapy, this was my post a couple of weeks ago. It, did you guys see the, it's with them. Um, it was somebody looking at a bridge and their alarm was sitting right next to them going, screaming, oh, yeah, I look at the bridge. And exposure therapy is really to send them to like really be exposed to the feeling of fear while you're on the bridge. It's not the bridge. The bridge is not dangerous and it's not learning how to get through the bridge or whatever the thing is, get through work, get through the presentation, because then the focus is always on the situation. Anxiety is not about the situation. Your body is sending you fear so you can get through the bridge. And if you're going at exposure therapy with getting through the bridge and you did it, you got over it, that is great, if in the, especially in the beginning. If you have not been over that bridge in 20 years and you got over the bridge, great job. And now you're going to get over the bridge. You're going to get better at not surviving over the bridge. You're going to get better at being in living mode while going over the bridge. Remember, you get into this mode when there's now danger. So I can have now anxiety for the bridge, but the fight is the glue sealer. I don't have to have now fight. It's the now fight that's the maintaining piece, not the now anxiety. Because again, anxiety is not danger. So if your body sends you fear for something, right, it's my job to show fear that where we are right now is safe. So too much exposure. I mean, sometimes people don't get to choose their exposure. Sometimes their exposure is just being home by themselves. And it's, they do the opposite. Who, who's an oppositer where instead of like, my thing is the bridge and my exposure therapy is 20 minutes a day. But basically for the most part, when I get home, I feel pretty good until I'm at the bridge. But then my, my oppositers are 
Like me being home alone with my own body and my own thoughts is the scariest thing ever. So I'll go over all the damn bridges. I'll go out. I'll be busy. I'll be distracted because it's me being home with my own scary body and my own scary mind is, is the, is the constant exposure. And that's why it's never the situation. It's how I treat how I feel wherever I am. And you can treat your body as danger anywhere. You can treat your mind as danger anywhere. Okay. So it's, you're going out and pushing. I have a lot of people that go out and and they're exhausted after exposure therapy. Yes, because it is hard to do because you're going to be flooded with fear. But overall, the goal is normalization, which means acting like, like here I am at this place and it's acting like this. Maybe fluctuating levels of fear, but being kind of like loose, the whole ghost spaghetti mindset while this is here. But if you're going at exposure therapy, prepping yourself before doing all your breathing techniques and then getting through it and telling yourself you can do it two more minutes. And then afterwards, it's the big sigh. And then you don't do much after because you have to recuperate because you did just did your exposure and now you feel fragile and that, that that's not normalization. That's still surviving through a minefield. So exposure therapy is treating where I am as safe. And sure, some people start small and they grow their tolerance for it. Um, so take it, take it with that mindset too. There's no like perfect check boxes. Um, I just want to reread this question again. Like, what if I'm kept too much on so here also here's the unspoken worst case scenario. What if there's a thing is too much exposure where I'm kept too much on high alert for too long. I haven't written a post on this yet, but notice the T O O word too, because this is fine. This is too much. And if something's too much, that usually means, right? I can handle this much weight, but not this much because then it breaks. Then I can't handle. Then it sets me back. Then it notice if you are using a lot of that word, that's too much for me to handle. Then that's two is, is, is one of those words that I, I tend to pick out in these posts. What if I'm kept too much on high alert for too long? What about it? You'll feel shit. But your story about that is probably one of more danger than I'll just feel uncomfortable. It's probably some version of I'll break or I'll go crazy, or I'll have a setback, or I'll never make it out of there. Who tells, who else on the chat, who tells stories like that about their, yeah, right on. Mm -hmm. Yep, all the time. So you see how that when I ask, and it's not just one person that responds, it is a multiple, multiple people that you will probably never meet in real life. Look, my body slash heart can't, handle it. This is why the opposite of anxiety is trust. I'm petrified of my own brain. My body sent my alarm is sending me fear for my body and fear for my brain because I am treating my body and brain as incapable, as about to become danger at any moment because I don't trust that it's okay. And you grow trust in something by letting it do what its job is. You grow trust in something by taking your eyes off of it. Not certainty, trust. Take a look at my post today. The opposite of doubt is not certain. The opposite of doubt is trust. Trust in my ability to feel bad. Okay. Boop, I just flipped my little thing here. All right, everybody. Trucking along. Let's see here. Is it normal? Is it typical? Is it common? Probably yes. Before I even keep going, does this happen to other people? Probably yes. Um, so let's keep reading the question. Is it typical? Does this happen often to others? And so feel free to chime in and say, yes, that's me too. Um, in the chat, as I ask this question, to feel bodily sensations like tingly slash weak legs, nervousness slash edginess, even queasiness after doing something that makes you anxious. 
I'm sure you had this question before, but I am new to DARE. Sometimes I feel even worse after I've done the thing I'm anxious about. Sometimes, excuse me, it's hours later or the next day. My anxiety is really high after a concussion fall in 2022. However, the physical therapist and neurologist said that it's the anxiety causing the strong body sensations and to treat the feelings as such. Anxiety, I am trying to break out of my atrophied world. It's a good, it's a good description. Um, like driving to the store on my own or going out to restaurants, etc. I listen to the fear of driving section, which helps me, which helped me start driving more. FYI, I was not told I couldn't drive was actually encouraged to drive. I've just had anxiety about it for some reason. I was not in a car accident. But when I get back home, the feelings listed above seem to come on. However, I have noticed that when I get the weak and tingly feelings in my legs, I will go for a short short walk. And it goes away most of the time because I said to myself, so what? But it's not working for the driving or bigger challenges yet. So, okay, I see a whole lot of yeses coming up, scrolling back. Yeah, that's what happens after you survive through something. This is no different than somebody saying, is this normal? Like after I go do a workout at the gym and after I lift weights for an hour that my muscles feel weird and tingly and tired? Of course, you've been tensing them for the last hour. Of course, that feels tingly and numb and exhausting. Your body just did something. Just because you're not externally working out, you're internally like there's tension, there's fight. And if you are in a heightened mode, heightened state, and if you're driving, you are probably driving like this. You are probably, this is just my guess, getting through the drive and trying to accept and allow. And your shoulders are probably up and you're clenching the steering wheel and you're probably leaned forward and, and you are very stiff. And so you come home and it's, you drop the fight, you drop the tensed, the tense way you're holding yourself. And now your body is allowed to release tension. And here comes the, the shaky legs, the jelly legs, the, the quivering, the, the shaky feeling. Of course. If your body was, if your body has somehow misinterpreted driving equals danger, driving equals absolute now danger, you're going to have adrenaline. And that's what adrenaline feels like as it's working its way through your body. So the short answer is, yep, yep, that's normal. That's normal. But then again, I don't have to do anything to get rid of it. It will dissipate on its own. But there's a good chance it dissipate on its own because yeah, I went out for a short walk and I took, I took my shaky legs with me and I went for a walk and, um, yeah, I was just like, "Mm, whatever. And if you take that, whatever mindset, it's one of those things. Again, I notice it goes away after it's gone because I wasn't checking to see if it went away. It doesn't happen directly. It happens as a look back. All right, everyone. Okay. Next question. Would you be actually this person wrote a question and then wrote a follow up answer to their own question, which I love that. Um, And I'm going to address both of them. Would you be able to address issues around climate change and or nuclear war? There's a great feeling of existential threat in the news. And I don't know how to keep a balance between ignoring it completely or becoming totally overwhelmed and hopeless. Who gets stuck in that? All of the terrible things that are going on in the world or that could be going in the world at any minute and all the awful things that other people are doing and like feeling completely out of control with all of this, all the things that could, what is this country saying? What is this? It talks about nuclear war. Tune in at 11, right? Combine that with the follow-up, um, their own follow-up response, which was, hi, I wrote before about eco-anxiety. I found I'd already written the answer to myself a couple of years ago. One, the world is still here. It might change and you won't always be part of it, but it will always be here. Two, we are some other species evolutionary pressure. Nature will heal over us and create wonderful things we can't even begin to imagine. True, true. And then you say that, like I was saying before, you give like, you know, the logical, practical, grounded example of 
you know what? The world's been here. The world will probably keep being here. We may or may not be on it the whole time. Yes. And then period. And then you don't continue to hook into that as a constant state of reassurance. I'm just mentioning that. Not that not that this person is saying that they're doing it, but I just know this is what a lot of people do. We hook on to, no, it's fine. They always talk about this. And, and then it always works itself out. No, this just says it'll probably be okay. And if you kind of notice you get stuck in the loop of trying to reassure yourself that it all will be fine, right? Notice the future orient, the future, it's still future oriented. Can't can't seem to say that word today. It's all about future base. Like, right? what if it does? No, 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 it's not going to. We're looking for certainty and uncertainty as opposed to, again, sounds weird, but the answer is, yeah, it could. Yep. Yeah, it could. Just like I could have a heart attack. There could be a nuclear war. The, I could die today. Something terrible could happen. Now, this might give you a rush of anxiety. That's okay, too. That's okay, too. This is this is what we do here. It's something made me feel anxious, and now I need to do something because I'm anxious? No, I don't have to do anything. Anxious showed up, and I can feel anxious. Yes, that news story made me anxious because I feel very out of control. Unless you are in charge of dropping nuclear bombs, really all you get to do is get better at how you treat coulds. Again, that was this was almost exactly, except it was about nuclear war, my post today. It could. And even if it didn't today, it still could. I still could get up from this chair and break my leg. It's never about the content of the could. A could, could, whether you fight it or not, whether it creates anxiety or not. And we get over involved in coulds trying to be less anxious or don't listen to the things that could because I can't feel this feeling. I can't handle it. Do you guys hear the same common thread words? Now, I'm just going off on a little bit of a tangent on this question, but I'm trying to use that, again, to answer other questions that pop up, um, you know, that are coming up on this call that I know I won't be able to get to all of them. Um, so that's just like the could of going crazy and the could of having a heart attack and the could of something terrible happens to my family member and the could of World War Three are all coulds. They are. They all could and it's our inability to, to accept coulds that's the problem it's the battle of the coulds because it all could work out great you could also win the lottery you just treat that could differently you don't fight that one you don't resist that one you like the feeling that comes paired with that could so there's no battle okay that yes the battle of the coulds you don't battle coulds. You battling coulds is the problem, not the coulds, not the anxiety that shows up to help you battle coulds. It's your continued continued battle. And to me, somebody was just saying having anxiety goes hand in hand with wanting to control everything. Always, to me, comes down to some version of control, vulnerability, and uncertainty. Just wanted to mention that as well. Okay, next up. Where are we? I started having, okay, this is a good one. And I'm not going to get too, too deep into this. But I just want to mention it because I think we mentioned on the last podcast, I, I started having panic attacks, we could do a whole webinar on this. When I was in sixth grade, I'm now 68. Dare and your podcasts have been so, so revealing and extremely helpful this past year. I am also using this to help with chronic symptoms. The treatment quote, treatment is almost identical because anxiety is also a chronic symptom. It's about not feeling safe in my body, etc. I had a very unsafe childhood. So I'm trying to create that feeling of safety, but it's not easy. You address that in your latest podcast. I appreciate that so much. Sometimes I feel like being unsafe is locked up in my subconscious. I know I'm quote, working on retraining my brain to think about things differently and get more comfortable being uncomfortable. That is a great question and is something we could honestly run an entire webinar on. Um, so for anybody, and I'm just, I'm not getting into trauma or chronic childhood trauma. Um, 
to pick apart trauma, but to talk about this piece as it may relate to trauma. And it might be a little bit of a different spin than what you maybe have heard before. Okay. Um, so, and I hear this from a lot of people who had a very difficult past history. Okay. And it's, it's, this comes up often of, I don't feel safe. And I'm trying to go like some people try and go back to how they used to feel safe, but I never felt safe. I never felt safe because I never knew what it was like to feel safe when I was seven or eight because I never was safe. So I don't know what safety feels like. And so uh, feel free to not comment. But if anybody is finds this relevant, welcome to comment that in the where we might get stuck of, but I don't even know what it feels like to feel safe because I never felt safe my whole freaking life because I was in danger a lot. And I wasn't kept safe by the people who were supposed to keep me safe or from the people who were supposed to keep me safe. So it probably served you well to stay in a heightened state. This guy probably did a really good kick-ass job of showing you all the terrible things that could because all of the terrible things maybe did. And so it served you well for survival to focus on doubt, to focus on the coulds. You didn't, you, feelings is something that happens following action. So it's not about trying to feel safe because if you don't know what that feels like, you won't know what it is when it's there. And so since safe isn't a feeling, we try and hook it to the next best thing, which is calm or comfortable or not scared. And and that's why it becomes this never ending 30 years of a million different therapies desperately trying to feel safe. But it's more of the goal here is I need to, pr- the, the goal is to practice. I If I am identified here is safe now, I start treating safe here now and act safe. Safe and the feelings follow the action. And it's never for the goal. It's never for the intended purpose of feeling a certain way. It's just that fear is safe and uncertainty in- inherently is safe. But if you were used to hanging on for dear life and it served you well, now you're here and you are safe. You're just, you're a good survivor. Probably why you're still here. You did a great job surviving. And now it's time to send the message to your alarm that I am safe and I don't need to feel safe to act safe. I surrender here. I go back to living mode. I'm making this sound very easy. It is not. I'm just trying to simplify how that piece ties in here of learning how to release your present fight here because, and and rather than trying to go down all these rabbit holes, trying to do a million techniques to feel safe. Cause what you're probably feeling is maybe calmer or less scared. And you don't, you can be not calm and still safe. And somebody put out Laura, the act safe thing always confuses me, but I'm not sure how to act safe. And that means you don't act safe. You just stop acting like there's danger. This is the whole trying to not notice something. This is like you fight the bear and then you just, when the bear dies or runs away, you just stop doing those things. You cease survival behaviors. You don't purposely try to act safe. You just stop surviving. I don't know. This is when I know I sound like I start talking like Dr. Seuss. I don't know if this makes sense. Even if it's a little bit confusing, it's like we get, it's it's about ceasing action, not trying so, it's just like trying so hard to accept and allow, trying to not notice something. It's, it's me staring at something that's the continued action and behavior and it's ceasing that. Doesn't mean it's easy. I'm just trying to keep it simple. It's yes. Like Moira, it's not trying, it's being. And so that's why I use those words a lot going from doing mode to being mode. And what does being look like? You, you go into being mode 
when life is safe. You go, if you're at the park having lunch, you're just engaged in life. You're talking to your family. Oh my God, bear. Now I go into doing mode because I'm doing something about bear until the bear is gone. The guy caught the bear. The bear is gone. <sighs> oh, that was scary. Ooh, oh, my heart is racing. So what was that story you were telling me? And you go back into like actions of living rather than actions of surviving. And then your body slowly starts the process of winding down from doing mode to being mode when you go from acting like I need to do something to acting like there's nothing to do. Um, all of this is more about attitude and mindset, not about doing certain techniques or following the letters the right way. Um, that's why I kind of speak in all these analogies. So I I'm hoping this makes sense to people. Use your own creative brains and your own analogies to try and send this message as well. Like, yeah, it's, it's like saying, so what? Correct. But saying, so what with the right, in the right way. Cause if it's like, it's okay. It's okay. So what? So what? It's fine. So what? So what? So what? So what? So what? So what? For 24 hours a day. It's like you say, oh, that? Mm -hmm. So what? Yeah, that was scary. Oh, yeah, that bear was scary. But there's no bear anymore. So, mm -hmm. so what? Oh, that's scared showed up, but there was no danger to plug scared into. So mm -hmm. I guess I'm just scared right now. And that's where the boring story comes in. Tell a boring story. I'm just trying to keep this G-rated, but I think I already said shit. So again, Moira wrote, the best response is definitely fuck it. That, after 14 years of working with Dare, those are the two words that I feel like sum up all of this. It's learning how to find your fuck it. And your fuck it is not, I don't, it's not to be hooked to the content of your thought. It's to be hooked to what action needs to be taken next. I don't like how I feel. Mm, oh, then I don't like how I feel. Mm, that's how I feel, period. And there's nothing else to do. No further involvement needed, period. Fuck it with a period, not fuck it. Did that work? Did it go away? It's mm, F it. That's the mindset. Say the words, but it's got to come from here. And if it's not coming from here yet, at least start with the words. Start by saying new words, because a lot of us just kind of keep spinning the same story over and over and over again. And notice, oh, somebody just beat me to it. It helps to pay attention to your body. Just going to say, your mouth, your brain and your body, right? You want them to be on the same page. So if you're like, I accept and allow, it's fine. Fuck it, I don't care. But you're like this. Your body is telling a different story than your mouth is. So your body and your mouth want to be on the same page. So if you're like, eh, you act, mm, this is a message of safety. This is a message of safety. You go into notice mode. Mm, oh yeah, there's a whole bunch of shitty thoughts. I, I don't like those thoughts. Mm, yeah. Period. The shrug. Your shrug is your new technique. Mm, practice shrugging at things I don't like. There's those thoughts. Yep. There's there's that cloud out there. Mm -hmm. Can I blow away the cloud? No. Okay. Now what? And as we get stuck in doing, these are doing disorders. And so it's just learning what the doing is, not what the discomfort is. It's never about what this thing is. This it could be disconnected. This could be dizzy. This could be intrusive thoughts. This could be whatever. And then we get stuck doing a lot of things about non-doable things because we happen to not like these versions of what shows up. Everybody's fighting intrusive thoughts that they don't like, not the intrusive thoughts that they find pleasant. Here's a thought that showed up. I don't like it and I want it gone. This is the problem not this. Treating this as the problem is the problem, not this. Because then I'm only okay if this is gone. And when it comes back, I need to do something else to try and either get rid of it or calm down. And so it always same, follows the same template. Let's keep going. Okay, next. How do I not fear DPDR? I know that it will not hurt me. 
I know it is normal, but I don't know how to not fear the sensation because it really is a strange feeling. Okay. I don't, that question always comes up. Juice of thoughts, DPDR always comes up. Um, so who deals with DPDR or just disconnected or the brain fog or feeling detached? I don't feel connected. That was another similar question on here. I have DPDR and I don't feel connected to my, to my partner. Anybody else dealing with, um, with that? Who's on the, um, on the chat on the call? Me? Yes. Yep. Yep. So how do I not fear blank? Okay. DPDR is just for context here. I'm not gonna like, it's not about getting into the like physiological reasons why I may have this feeling or is it iron or is it this? It's sometimes I feel disconnected and my body has at some point gotten the message that this was danger, either based by how I treated it or it was a random misfire. And now fear has sealed itself to feeling disconnected. So that's why the rest of this call, uh, the rest of this, the answer to this question isn't really about trying to feel more connected, trying to find five blue things and, and, and convince yourself that you're fine and reassurance that, oh, your partner loves you. No, everything's real. It's fine. It'll go away soon. That's still the focus on the present feeling being the problem. Fear has a way of imprinting itself into whatever the thing is. For me, it was nausea. Why? I think I just happened to be nauseous when I randomly had a panic attack in the movie theater and whoosh, nausea doesn't just feel nauseous anymore. Nauseous felt danger. Not even scary. When fear hooks itself to something, it doesn't even feel scary anymore. It feels like danger right now, need to get out of here right now, need to do something right now, need, need to hang on for dear life until this feeling passes. They sort of merge. Uh, if you scroll back far enough, I have a um, a video where I'm holding paddles. Did you guys see this one? It's like translucent paddles and it's green. And it says, I, I use the example thoughts. I wrote scary thoughts. I said, let's break down what this really is. And then I separate the paddles and one is blue and what is, one is yellow. And one says scared, scary, and one says thoughts. And so it was green. Oh my God, green thoughts. But when you separate it, I have my body sending me scared for thoughts. Replace that with my, my alarm screams and sends me fear for feeling weird. My body sends me fear for nausea for dizzy, for whatever. G give me give me another example, everybody in the chat. So now I feel nauseous and I feel scared. Both are safe. Both are safe. That's the message. Your body, like you don't try and not be scared and you don't logic scared away and you don't fight through exposure therapies or convince yourself it's fine to eliminate fear. Fear leaves when it sees you don't need it and it sees you're not using it. You get better at being with the feeling rather than doing something about the feeling. Now, some people just have might have that whoosh. I will probably always get a whoosh of anxiety when I'm nauseous because it's sort of paired up decades ago. Again, my response is, Mm -hmm. Does that mean I'm not recovered? Does that mean how the hell is she supposed to be a therapist and help everybody if she can't even help herself? Oh my gosh, she's still anxious? Well, how the hell am I supposed to? It's still the, if your goal is elimination, that's the problem. It's, I can feel anxious. Oh, my, my body misinterprets nausea as danger. And I used to spend a lot of time making a lot of accommodations about nausea because I spent a lot of time treating nausea as danger because, oh my God, what if I throw up? Can't throw up, but it's okay, Michelle, who cares? Like logically, who cares? It's not a logical thing. And so I spent a lot of time involved in making accommodations for my whole life to try and not feel a feeling. Okay. So it's, yeah, I'm nauseous. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the scared for nausea, but I just feel 
nauseous and you get better at feeling the feeling that's there, whether it's nausea, whether it's shortness of breath, whether it's DPDR, your body sends you fear. Sometimes it's useful and practical. If you're about to fall off the side of a cliff, it would be great if you have a body that's good at sending you fear. Okay. You should use that fear to not fall off the cliff. If you have a body that doesn't send you a lot of fear, not generally on these calls, but let's say tend to be our partners, right? The beers, the natural beers. We are the natural doers. Let's say those people generally don't get a whoosh, but they're about to fall off the cliff too. They should still try and not fall off the cliff, whether they're whooshed or not. But the whoosh helps us stay alive through danger. We just happen to get whooshed at the wrong time sometimes. And so sometimes it makes sense. Oh, I got whooshed because I got whooshed on this alley because this alley reminded me of the time I did get mugged. So this guy sent me a whoosh just in case a bad thing happens again. Because a bad thing happened. Here's that memory that reminded me. Let's give her a preemptive whoosh. Just in case danger shows up, she's prepped for danger. And so we tend to get prepped for danger more often than other people. Still okay. Woo, I got prepped for danger, but oh no, this is just an alley. Oh, my, my body remembers, yeah, I was in danger once on this alley. And so I might be more scared walking down this alley than somebody else. That's also okay. That's okay too. Like, I was just trying to set up my office before the call and I have, um, I had a heat press machine in there that I am scared is going to burst open someday as I'm trying to carry it because it's one of those latch, uh, anybody have a heat press machine? You have to push down to lock it. And I'm always afraid when I pick it up that it's going to get unlocked and like hit me in the face or crash on the floor. Um, I feel that way about my stand mixer too in the kitchen. Every time I pick it up to move it, I feel like it's going to get unlatched. It's going to fall on my toes. So when I pick up that mixer, I like try not to drop it. I am in a more of a heightened state. It's not an anxiety disorder. I just feel more alert than like if my husband were to pick it up. He just happens to not have that physiological response. I do. The disorder is my relationship with my own body's natural physical response. Do you see the difference, everyone? Like, we don't need final elimination. It's never about eliminating anxiety. You don't eliminate it. That's the basis of dare. It's changing your relationship with it. Just like you don't eliminate sad. You don't eliminate anger. You trying to get rid of feelings is the disordered relationship with feelings. Healing is healing your relationship with what your body does, not stopping your body from doing things and only the doing, doing the things that feel pleasant. Okay, let's see what else do we have here. Okay, oh, here's another one. I start college on the 17th of August and I'm very nervous. Anxiety, oh, okay, wait, I just sort of touched on this. Anxiety makes me feel really sick and sometimes I almost start to gag. I have a phobia of being sick, so you can imagine this is really scary for me. How do I incorporate DARE into my year at college in terms of face of fearing these sick feelings? This was me. This was me. This was me starting in high school and it was the feels like I'm about to throw up oh my gosh, don't throw up. And then felt the pressure to get through the classes and the door would close and then you feel trapped. And then I would gag. I would have this, I have very low, high, would you call it gag response where I'm a good, I'm a, I, I would gag more than somebody else. Right. And so I'm trying so hard to hang on and which made that happen more. And then I would be surviving through the classes and surviving through being in somebody's car and getting through. So like, again, like, like you don't need to get through the, the class. It's your alarm is sending you fear for what if you throw up. And honestly, the mindset is that, that I throw up. What we say next is, I don't want to throw up, right? I don't want a nuclear war. I don't want to throw up. I want to feel connected. I am at odds with what is right? What is, is that I feel nauseous right now. 
There's a difference between I feel nauseous and I feel like I'm about to throw up. One is a feeling. This, the other is a feeling plus a prediction. Notice when you're making a prediction and then fighting the feeling, trying to prevent the prediction. Who follows this, this path of thinking? Because this is a common, common thing. It feels like I'm about to go crazy. Feels like I'm about to pass out. Feels like I'm about to stop breathing. I feel like I'm about to be completely disconnected from my body and my soul flies untethered into the universe. And so based on this, I'm going to fight this feeling to prevent that worst case scenario. That's, that's why it's never really about the content of what these questions are. Ah, there's all my yeses. Good. Do you guys see how you're, you're not alone? not alone. It's just, we all just, for whatever reason, we, we just hooked on to different subjects. And that's why it's like, she didn't talk about dizzy on this call. She didn't talk about breathing. I don't really need to talk about breathing because unless you have a breathing problem and I'm a pulmonologist, I am not here to talk about your breathing. I'm here to talk about your relationship with breathing. I'm not here for this really. I'm here for this. When we have created a relationship with something that the way I treat this thing sends a message to this guy that this is danger. And down below here, zero to two is safe. Anything above three is danger. And it's really not. And and Bessie, you're right. It really does apply to everything. It applies to everything. How, what, what's happening and how am I treating what's happening. So what's happening right now? That's your grounding. What's happening right now? I notice a tree is about to fall on me. Oh my God, that's danger. So I will attend to the falling tree. I will fight, flee, freeze, or protect myself from the tree. Perfect. You will probably be in a very heightened state, but it will be plugged into surviving through trees So you probably won't even notice like my heart did like this weird thing. And then I kind of felt disconnected. You don't even give a shit. Like there's a tree falling on me. And you're so involved in the danger that you're not involved in the fear. We were never meant to be involved in fear. When fear showed up at the wrong time, we then over involved ourselves in it. And then fear gets marked as the identified danger. So your body keeps sending you fear. Your body sends you fear for dizzy. Your body sends you fear for bridges. Your body sends you fear for fear. Your body sends you fear for whatever it is you're using that fear to fight. All right. Good. Everybody uh, following along? Anybody new um, who's new on the webinar hearing this for the first time? Does this make sense? Or are you like, what is she talking about? Or are you thinking, how come nobody ever like said it this way first? Like, how come this is so not normal? How come this is everything so pathologized and trying to come down and trying to get rid of it? Um, that usually um comes up as well too. But we're trying to like simplify it and normalize it. Doesn't mean it's easy, but sometimes if it's taught as a simple sort of thing, we tend to over complicate the shit out of it. It feels very complicated. And so that's why I kind of speak like I'm five years old to what's happening right now. If it's not a tree falling on me, it's a, uh, oh, what's happening right now? Oh, it's a thought I don't like. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me check this super artistic rendition of, oh, thought. Oh, whoops. Whoops. Thoughts are in danger. Turns out at some point in my life, I developed a disordered relationship with thoughts where I started, I got into the habit of fighting thoughts and whoops, turns out thoughts are in danger. So I have to start treating thoughts as safe. And a setback is not the fact that I got whooshed again, is that I go back into this again. I go back to ruminating. I go back to being involved. I'm back to fighting. I'm back to comparing. I'm back to reassurance. I'm back to catastrophizing. I'm back to predicting. I'm back to like making decisions based on how I feel or how I think I'm going to feel. I'm back to judging my feelings. That's the problematic part here. Not the fact that 
I was doing fine and I was sleeping great. And then for whatever reason, I had a terrible night's sleep and now I'm having a setback. The setback was not the terrible night's sleep. The setback was you saying that terrible night's sleep was a setback because now your okayness is only based on the things your body automatically does. Just so somebody asked something about setbacks. I just wanted to, uh, yep. Setbacks. My setback was reverting to old habits. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like saying like, I'm having a relationship setback. Just went back into old patterns of behavior. It's not the fact that I got another whoosh. So what? I got another whoosh. So my alarm misfired. It really was never a problem to begin with. Us doers, we had a misfire, and then we are desperately trying to not have it happen again. And that's that's kind of what keeps it stuck and going. All right, guys. Well, um, unfortunately, we um, didn't answer all of them because there were probably 80-something questions that came through. But I, I tried to... I tried to answer them in a way that was just sort of um, overall response that it doesn't matter. Like I didn't talk about being tired or I didn't talk about heart palpitations, but do you see it's not about heart palpitations. It's about all of the same storytelling, the same labeling feelings as danger, my inability to feel feelings, trying to feel safe is really you just battling whatever the present feeling is. And it's, it's surrendering to feelings, getting better of, of getting better at feeling, not trying to feel better. I know it's a strange sort of approach, but as you grow your tolerance for your ability to feel all forms of bothered, which can be bothered, discomfort, scared, disgust, all of the feelings we find unpleasant. Unpleasant doesn't equal bad and pleasant doesn't equal good. We've just decided that because I like, oops, sorry, I like these. I don't like these. Better get rid of these. And what that does is labels them as danger. And I'm only safe when they're gone. I'm only safe when I feel good. Okay. And that's, that's the that's what we're working on here with Dare. Getting better at feeling unpleasant. I look good and refresh because I'm in a better lighting. It's not me. I'm tired. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining the webinar. This will be uploaded onto the app probably within the next day. Um, eventually, it will be put out as a podcast and on the um, on the Dare YouTube channel. Um, you can um, submit more questions. We won't always get to all of them. If your question wasn't answered, there's a good chance it's been answered sometime over the past 14 years. Um, you can go back and do like a search on some of the Facebook pages, like the Dare Community page. Um, search through my Instagram page, the Anxiety Paradox, it's called. Aida has um, an Instagram page called Aida Becco. Um, we also have the Dare Response Instagram page, um, the YouTube channel. We've answered, there, there's a good chance your question has been answered. If not, sometimes, hopefully once I get unpacked a little bit more, I'll go live on Instagram and I'll answer some questions that we didn't get to. I just haven't done that in a bit. Um, but there's a good chance if we didn't answer your specific questions, um, they're somewhere out there in Dareland. So take a quick search on the Facebook pages and, um, and I will see you on the next webinar. Bye everyone. Take care. Thank you for listening to the D.A.R.E. podcast. The D.A.R.E. app has over 1 million downloads and is helping people all around the world to overcome anxiety and panic attacks. You can download the app for free at dareresponse.com.